Hey everyone, it's so good to be back. We got sick there for a second, so it's taking a little bit of time to get back in the swing of things. Um, today is a very special video because I really wanted to create wellness videos. And so today I sit down with my friend Liliana Yamas, who's an amazing therapist, and we create a smash book journal as we talk about different coping strategies. So let me know in the comments below if you guys do like these videos and I'll make sure to post them every so often. But please take a look. It was so much fun and I'm so excited for you guys to watch this. All right, everyone. So I'm finally here with my friend Liliana. Hi, everyone. My name is Liliana Yamas. I'm a licensed clinical therapist, but most importantly, I'm Sandy's friend. Yes, I'm so lucky. I actually got to work with Liliana last year and it was such an amazing experience. I was able to see how she connects with her clients and I was really more fascinated about the fact that you are such a fan of the scientific aspect of how we react, what happens within our body. Yeah, of the psychoeducational piece that I give to all my clients and anyone I know, to be very clear and honest, because it is a neuroscience and our biology of how our body is just responding to any threat, fear, loss that it has to protect itself from yeah. through our vagus nerve. So I do that psychoeducation and there's nothing wrong with you. There's just a lot going on around you and how that impacts you physically. I think that's the first time that I've even heard it explained that way, which blew my mind. So I appreciate that. Today we're going to do some coping skills. Yes. So what are we going to do today? So this is actually one of my personal favorites. And to be quite honest, as a therapist, I am very big on practicing what you preach. And this today, we're actually going to be doing journaling because, you know, Perfect. through our own conversations I've been telling you we got a journal we got a journal well we explain what your why journaling is such a key so this is where I get nerdy okay. <laughs> yeah I guess. yeah so just to kind of simplify it when something occurs to us we react through our right side of our brain which is our emotional side and when we are trying to respond to a threat we just react we don't use the left side of our brain to put logic into it because our intuition is we have to survive yeah. so then when we don't process some experiences then that's what becomes trauma and a lot of people think trauma is something like horrific that happened but really what it is it's unprocessed emotions that we really didn't get to understand why they happen. I think anytime somebody says like trauma, it's such an impactful word where you think, man, they must have gone through crazy amounts of experiences, but really anything can be it, right? Oh, 100%. I think a really good, just simple example is like, let's say a five-year-old that's really excited to show their mom uh, what they created for them, a picture or yeah. whatever it be, and they go to the mom and the mom is busy, not intentionally trying to ignore the child, but is like, not right now, not right now, then they might feel a little defeated. And then the next day they go to school and they're so excited that they finish their work and they go show their teacher and the teacher's like, go sit down. So then we start creating these thoughts that are negative cognitions of like, oh, oh my gosh, like I'm not worthy or, or I, I'm not good enough or I should not speak. And then we start closing off in life and create this like trauma of like, I'm not good enough. I'm not going to do this. I'm not. And it could have been so simple. And it's solely just not knowing how to process that what's happening is, is the issue. Yes. The lack of processing and not understanding. And mm -hmm. I know I use the example of a five-year-old, but they really are not able to understand in yeah. a five-year-old brain. As adults, we're able to understand certain things, but not all things. So one time when I told you, I was like, man, it's crazy to think that, you know, you see these adolescents that have similar issues that adults have but they process them so differently. Their perspectives of them are so differently. And I remember making that comment to you and you said, you know, not everybody, like even adults are not processing it the way you think, just because we're adults, we're having to processing it better than adolescents. It has nothing to do with age. Oh, 100%. I think <laughs> mental health does not discriminate. No, That no. is the one equal equality of it. <laughs> 100%. And then, you know, with our talks, like I, we are very big on coping skills and finding what works for you. Just because something works for you doesn't mean it's gonna work for me. Oh, 100%. And also too, depending on your symptoms, not all coping strategies as amazing as they are, are they going to work the same way? I always tell my clients when you're feeling anxious, you need to do things that calm you down. When you're feeling heavy emotion, you got to do things that move you out of that. Oh, see, and that's good because in different situations, you're going to need something different. Yeah, yeah, because a lot of people think like, oh, I just listen to music. But is that really even processing? Like what you need. <laughs> <laughs> what you need and what we want isn't always what we need. Yeah, because sometimes I would imagine if I'm sad and then I just listen to music that's 
sad music, maybe that's not going to help me get out of my, my state of mind. No, and actually there's some fun research on that, on how our senses are impacted and create crystals within the body of how we interpret things. So mm. like, um, but that's maybe for another time. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> I'm love, I, I love science, I guess. <laughs> I mean, if you guys really like the science aspect of it, we can film another video where we can really deep dive into some of these things. So like I said, for coping skills, we always talk about what works for us. Recently, a therapist had asked me like, well, what's your coping skill? What, what were you taught to how to self-soothe yourself growing up? And I laughed because I didn't even know what that meant. <laughs> and I'm sure it's really common with, you know, with a lot oh, of people. I mean, even myself, if you were to ask me what I did as a teenager, I would probably go cry in my room. <laughs> Which I think crying is a good way to express your feelings, but yes. if you don't process that, you know, you're kind of stuck. <laughs> but yes, and yes, crying is one way of releasing that emotion, but you also have to articulate what that emotion is. Yeah. And understand why you feel the way you feel. And I think coming in a Hispanic background where you don't talk about your feelings, you don't say anything that, you know, even articulates defending why you're feeling the way you're feeling it was just shut down in, in my home. So to me, it was just like, I just cried and I, I don't know, I just felt horrible. Yeah. And I couldn't articulate because no one ever showed me how to do that. And especially because I think of crying, you think of somebody being sad, but really that there could be so many other feelings behind that you could be hurt. You yeah. know, it's, it's really interesting how we dwindle down crying or something else that you're doing as like one simple thing, but it's not, it's like so layered. And even like crying um, and frustration, you know, I always say that anger is sadness acting out and, and people don't even see the resemblance. They see anger as this like resentment, evil feeling, but really what it is, it's, it's your sadness acting out and it has to do with how sad you are and your body's just trying to react because you probably were holding that sadness in. My mind is blown. You know what I'm saying? You guys see why she's so great? I love it. So tell me what we are going to do. Let's, okay. Let's process some uh, some things today. Yeah. So going back to a little bit why we're doing this is because when we're actually journaling, not only are we physically writing our emotions, but this is the other thing. I don't know if you've, you know, maybe we do that ourselves, but we repeat what happened to us. We repeat it and repeat it and it still doesn't feel good enough. And you might think like, oh, well, if you talk about it, you feel better. Yes. Guilty. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes we don't feel hurt. So if we don't feel hurt, we're going to keep telling our story and possibly re-traumatizing ourselves, reliving it. So writing it down, not only is a really good way because we're physically writing it, but seeing it, we're validating it. Mm. So you're saying that we don't need that validation from anyone else, you know, to get over an experience. It's just really just from us. It's from us. Sometimes we could obtain it from others, but the reality is, is that if we were never taught how to receive that validation and we're seeking it elsewhere and we're not getting that idea of what we think validation is, then we're constantly repeating and re-traumatizing ourselves. So it's very important to learn how to cope with your emotions that also validate them. Hmm. So being able to physically write them out is one thing. And when we're writing our emotions, we're also working our right side of the brain. So it's like the emotional part, the creative side. And as we're working the right side of the brain, we're seeing and validating our emotions on paper. I don't know if you ever think about it, but like, we could say things like blah, 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 blah. And we're like, oh shoot, why did I say that? But in text. Uh, all the time, yeah. <laughs> but in text, we're like, uh, no, no, no. Da, 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 da. And then if yes. we're going to send an email, it gets a little bit more intense. <laughs> so then we're allowing our brain to write without judgment, but still really thinking about what we're feeling, expressing the right side of the brain, validating it. And then within this, the reason why this is so special is because I'm actually going to teach you on how to incorporate the more creative side of it, Ooh. which is important because anytime we do coloring, creative activities, we're actually strengthening our right side of our brain to create stronger solutions because then we're able to not just go black and white, pass, fail. I love that. You know? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to show you how we could do that with a simple 99 cent journal and create a masterpiece out of it that is intentional, valuable, and it honors our needs. 
I cannot wait. Every time I come here and we do this, I feel like a weight gets lifted off of my shoulders. That's how I feel. I'm... That's why I invite you. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's something so fun and it's so intimate and personal and, and we both get so much out of it. Yeah. So why not put it on the internet, right? <laughs> why not? All right. So what's the first step to do this? Okay. So the first step to do this, I want you to grab any of them. Okay. Well, I'm I just going to mark your name. pen. But what I want you to do, you could either write it in the cover or um, write it in the inside, but you know, it already has this right here. Okay. But it doesn't really matter. Wherever you want to write it. And just know that whatever you write, it's going to be covered. So nobody's going to see it except yourself. But I, what I want you to do is put an intention to what you want out of this journal. So after you process your emotions, what do you want to receive out of it? That could be clarity, worthiness. It could be feeling balance, anything that after you process, this is how I want to feel like one word or it could be an emotion. And okay. Writing, and you could write it down. You could write in one word or in a sentence and I'll do the same here. Okay. By the way, when we start doing the journaling, you're not going to see any of it. Well, I might, sh I might share a little bit. Who knows? We'll see. We're balance. Who, who doesn't need balance in their life? And I think that when we go through like a roller coaster of events in your life, that's what I want to keep me grounded. Oh, 100%. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I've shared with you why balance is so important because there could be so many areas of our life. Like, let's say work is going so great, but you still feel empty because maybe home life is not great. Mm. So there's even that importance of like balance within what is important in your life. Yes. So now what we're going to do is we are going to select our covers. Perfect. Select at least two sheets. Okay. That you like. And we're going to create the cover for our journal. Perfect. I think I may have already found my two. Okay. These are the two that I picked. I okay. think it goes this way. It goes however you want it oh, to go. Oh, that's true. Yes. Mm -hmm. But the writing goes this way. But yeah, I guess you could do it anyway. And I liked it because it kind of reminded me of like a brain in the middle. <laughs> oh my gosh. I see it. And then B, I don't know if you can see if you can zoom in. But then with the green area, it looks kind of like plants in my head. My and uh -huh. this one reminds me of... My dear friend Andrea, who passed away a few years ago, and so I thought that was really pretty. Oh, uh, okay. So now I want you to kind of look at how you want to utilize them to cover your actual journal. And I can do it any way I want. Yeah. So let me show you some examples. Some individuals, what they like to do is kind of maybe half like this, and then half like that. Mm -hmm. Some oh, people it's pretty. like half like this. Some people even like to kind of tear it. That's what I was thinking. And then create this new pattern and texture to it. I love that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. There is one rule to this. What is it? You can't do nothing wrong. Oh. That is the number one rule. You guys. There is no wrong way of doing this. Number one rule, only rule, other than what your gut tells you, what you feel is right. And I actually love that you went with um, texture because at the end of this, you're going to see how we put all of our senses to be awakened through this. So when did you start smash booking? I started smash booking in a very challenging time in my life. Anything that you could imagine is your biggest fear in life came true to me. Wow. Biggest fear. I mean, with my home, my work, my pet, my family's health, everything was shooken, shooken, shooken. I was going to therapy because even though I'm a therapist, I could only get so far. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, there's something I'm not getting here. Maybe because I was doing already my own therapy by myself. I was like, no, I'm a little bit advanced. So then it got a little frustrating. And a friend told me about this class. I went to a few classes and I saw magic literally magic happened. There was points to where there was answers because we would begin with a meditation mm -hmm. and that's how we would get our intention of what we were journaling. Uh -huh. We did the art part of it. Sometimes our instructor would be like, if it's just getting overwhelming, just close it and let it go. And we would like open it. I kid you not, there's times where I, it was a hot mess of stuff that I was like, uh, it's just not coming out. And I would open it and it would be a butterfly. Wow. I know for one friend in particular, she was having a lot of feelings about a loved one that was sick and she closed her book. And then when she opened it, there was a profile of a woman. Wow. And she closed her book and she went to go with loved one. So there's some magical things that could happen through this because 
our unconscious mind is being set to do what it wants to do in a very healthy nervous system place. Mm -hmm. And once we do that, we just gotta listen. And it, it's interesting how you are advanced, because obviously this is what you do as well. But you think that that's so common and not just for people who are therapists, but anybody, right? Like they have that attitude of, I can take care of this on my own. What do I need this for? And I think that that shows you that, though I'm sure maybe people are more advanced on their way of thinking or the way they process things, but it's always beneficial to see someone if you are going through a hard time and maybe you keep going back to that that tra uh, trauma because clearly something is not getting processed. Oh yeah, and this, this is the thing for me too. Now just even um, say it a little bit more out loud. The reason why the therapy that I was obtaining through the therapist wasn't clearly getting to me was because I was living in the trauma. Mm. So I was already in the fight flight, like I gotta survive, I gotta survive. So talking through it, I was like, but wait, I'm in here. So talking to it, it was also almost creating a trauma to me. Interesting. Because not only was I physically living in that time, but talking about it was reliving it. And so it just, that's why therapy was also very challenging for me because I was in, yeah, just not one trauma. I had like compound trauma, like yeah. this collateral of trauma that was basically everything out of my control. And I had to live in it yeah. for a full year, 365 days. And I will say, I can't imagine I've lost, you know, my dad and that same, within months I had lost my, my one of my best friends. And I think that of course reflected on my relationship. I had such a hard time communicating what I needed and how I was feeling. And a lot of the times it came out as like anger or, you know, frustration. Mm -hmm. And so it must have been hard too, because like you said, the, then you can't even be at home to be in your safe space because now your foundation of your home is ruined and, it, and you must have felt very lost. 100%. Yeah. And so that's why when going to therapy, I was like, uh, there, I need something else. Yeah. I'm done with, so I just glue it all together? Yes. And while you're doing that piece, Sandy, mm -hmm. I'm actually going to be showing you what is the next step. Let's okay. do it. What you're going to do is you're going to take at least the first three pages and leave them alone. But then after, I, um, I don't know if you guys were noticing, but I would grab one page and then I would glue two of them together. So I have a lot of these um, pages already glued together. So a little bit thicker. Once you have done that throughout your whole entire book, what you do is you go back and you think about what was my intention, okay? So I'll share my intention too, is worthiness and clarity of like knowing that, yeah, that is what I wanted. So what you do then is you grab the first two pages glued together and this is you, you go worthy, worthy. And you just keep on doing that. It's like a chant. Yeah, it really is. And you don't have to say it out loud, but each one, like you keep on going back and you're saying worthy. That looks beautiful by the way. Oh, here's the front. And here's the back. I'm kind of obsessed with this. Am I going to go into you know, designing journals? <gasps> oh my God. All right, so Liliana, what do you do now? I still see clients. I have my own private practice. And within my private practice, I service um, adolescents and adults that either want to work through different challenges in life, as well as having symptoms of depression, anxiety, uh, PTSD, because trauma is my specialty. Oh. Um, and my modalities um, are based more um, within trauma, but I mean, this is the thing, like a lot of people don't like to work with trauma and I love to work with individuals with trauma, so everything else just comes in favor for that. And why do you like working with trauma? Like what like speaks to you about it? I worked with individuals, and I should say children, for about, I want to say 13 years. Oh, wow. And they had a lot of complex trauma. And to me, it was learning how to support them and assist them in finding hope in their lives when they didn't know how to obtain it. Mm -hmm. And I was trained with trauma-focused kind of behavior therapy as the modality in, in, in which I supported children. And I just fell in love with it, you guys. I really did. And 
I think that for many individuals, they don't know what trauma is and for them to understand how it creates symptoms of anxiety, depression, PTSD, and to have that hope just made me fall in love. Wow. When I was going to grad school, I was like, oh, I'm going to work with geriatrics. I love the older population. So even when you know and you think you know, you don't know. You, these doors open and you walk through them and things just happen. There's so many people who know exactly what they want to do. Like from the get-go, they're like, this is what I've always wanted to do. And and unfortunately, I feel like I it took me longer to realize like what my passion was, what I enjoyed doing. and. So it is kind of cool to hear your story where it sounds like maybe you were in the same boat and through the experience of kind of just following a certain path, you found what you felt like you were made to do. 100%. Yeah, I think I just kept an open mind of wanting to grow. And yeah. still to this day, I'm constantly wanting to grow, wanting to learn and help others that it just came natural and these doors open and people come into your life that just give you this awakening. Yeah. This year I'm working on like letting go of those expectations that I have for myself or that I feel like society has for me. Oh, yeah. Especially as I'm getting older and things like that and how people very much are like, things happen in a timeline and you know, you you get at your job and then you get married and you have, it's like such a check off list, you know? I always compare myself to myself and my happiness, my level of happiness, and I know my happiness is gonna be different from your happiness. Yeah. And I've learned to accept what is for me and what is me and love where I'm at. And were you oh did you always have that that mindset? Uh no, I was raised by a Hispanic mother. <laughs> <laughs> and so it did not come natural. Mm -hmm. Um it came with experience and it came with time and a lot of work and compassion. I love that you said that because I get lost in showing compassion for myself in like different times of my life. And, and I don't think it's really known to have that for yourself, right? 100% and I mean, and there's a reason why there's such a thing as compassion fatigue. It's a real thing. That's something that I'm definitely working on this year is having a little bit more compassion when I feel I'm not doing enough or I'm not where I want to be or thought I would be. You know, to say, hey, it's okay. I'm on, I'm not on anyone's timeline except my own. And that's going to change throughout every month, every year, five years. My book is just like ginormous. Compare, is it similar? Yeah, mine is the same one. And I will say, just so if you guys make these at home, I must have skipped a few pages. So some of these pages have three pages glued to each other. Same. <laughs> Same. No, and there's no wrong. That's right. The rule is there are no rules. Can I tell you something we used to do and, um, and see if you're open to doing it? Yeah. So when we would all gather, obviously we all had our projects, right? And something that was really beautiful in having so many people, because you said, you know, you asked me about the group setting. Oh, yeah. Well, one of the things that I loved was that we would also take a piece of somebody else's work mm -hmm. and we would put it in our journal. So I, I gift you, let me see, making sure it's not the same, but here I gift you this piece. Oh, thank you. So you could always remember me in your journal. That's so nice. So do I put it inside of my journal? Anywhere you Anyone. want. And if you want to put it like in your pocket to use it for another time. because you I already know it. exactly where I'm going to put it, guys. And and it only brings, you know, a bigger relationship to, to your journal and yourself. And it's a constant reminder that you're not alone. I love that. After you journal, you do an art piece on top, which then allows that creativeness, that alternative solution. Mm -hmm. And you go back through your journal and it's just like this book of artwork. So if somebody were to find your journal, they don't know like your deepest secrets in there. All they see is this beautiful art book. So it looks like a sketchbook. For me, is something so heavy, something so deep, then looks so beautiful. Oh, I love that. Yeah, so where I could go back and see it and remember it and not be painful, but more so of this um, beautiful piece of me of imperfection. Wow, I really love that. I think that that's something that could be almost scary to somebody, right? Like the idea of putting your whole self into something, even, you know, nobody is going to read it and it's just for you. Sometimes facing those own emotions for yourself can be overwhelming. 100%. Yeah. So I 
decided I'm going to use the paper that you gave me mm -hmm. and I created a heart. How beautiful. There's music notes here and the pattern of it is red. And I just thought, and it kind of has like a shape of a heart almost. Oh. And I thought on my journal, I feel like the swiggly lines are my, is my journey. And my goal is to ba get balanced within my own heart. You know what, Sandy, that is so beautiful. I love that. It's like so storytelling. Remember I told you that then you grow this like intimate relationship with your journal? Yeah. I promise you this journal is something that you're not gonna wanna just be like, uh, whatever, throw it away. You're gonna be like, no, there's life in here. There's emotion in here. You know, there is so much. Yes. And here I thought I was like, I just want to just think cool and like meaningful to myself. But yes, now that I said it out loud, <laughs> I think it is something you that validate I'll, it. I'll always treasure it. Yes, for mm -hmm. sure. So Telling you. I don't know if you guys can see the heart. I'm thinking about shade or doing like a shading, but I like it like that. I don't want to. I don't want to go too far and then be like, oh, I messed it up. You know, there's no such thing. That's right. Oh, see. That mindset, you gotta get out of it. You gotta get out of what it's supposed to be because it's not, it's whatever you wanna make it. Yeah, I mean, obviously, look at me over here. I don't even know what I... No, I actually, you guys are gonna see, hers looks so cool and it's just proof that she is so artistic and mindful. Um, literally just rip pieces of paper, you guys. No, it's very cool. And I allowed it to be whatever it wanted to be. Kind of like, you know, how I embrace myself. I allow myself to be whatever I, I need to be. It is true. But you've really made yourself who you wanted yourself to be. And I think that is so huge on not just on like being a therapist, just like an individual person. Like she could be working at Ralph's and have this mindset and just move people. When I see people react to her, it's just, you can tell that she makes people feel the love. And it's that's so special. Thank you. So special. Yeah. Thank you. I'm like tearing up, like <laughs> cutting the onions. But yeah, and I think I told you my story was that I remember being 12 years old. Like this is how specific it is. I remember being 12 years old and there was this woman named Betty that was a friend of my mother. And every time I saw her, I felt like the most beautiful person in the world, in the room. And mind you, I wasn't at 12 years old. Like I was completely what you would not define to be beautiful. And my mom was a reminder how not beautiful I was. But when I met Betty, I felt like Miss Universe and I was beautiful. And I said to myself, this is how I want people to feel when they're with me. I want yeah. them to feel how much they are important. They are heard. They are seen. And, and it just became part of me. That was a powerful 12 year old. I guess so. Courageous 12 year old. That was beautiful. Yeah. And a heart. See? Tell you. Don't let. I'm all tell coming you. back to my heart that I put in my journal. Okay? All right. And here's, I guess, my journal. As you can see, I just used one piece and then I cut all the straps and just kind of created like a little border. That's Isn't beautiful. this like starting to look already? Yeah. Thing? And when I saw it, when she was working on it, it made it seem like. These were like the pages, like the book cover was almost cut short and you could see all the pages being exposed. Yeah. Do you want to do the first pocket page? Yeah, let's do it. Super simple. We're just gonna cut like that. Okay. Rip like that. Literally, I just cut the page in half. <laughs> and... Here's my first pocket. Oh my gosh. Decorated, so I just show. whatever it is. So we cut these two pages in half and then on the other page put some glue and then you press it down. And then this is your pocket page right here. Mm -hmm. Very cool. All right, what's next? With this one is just kind of like a divider. Okay. Or unless you want to make another pocket through the back side of it. Yeah. But you get to decide whatever you want. Yeah. So that's a good idea, actually. We're gonna start with our grounding page. Okay. Okay, and it's not a journaling page, but it's really, really important to have a grounding page because sometimes we have to take a deep breath before we journal. So let's create our grounding page next. Okay, let's do it. So basically, you just kind of want to find the middle. So what I want you to do for your grounding page is grab a pen, pencil, whatever you want. First, lay your hands comfortably. If it feels comfortable, start tracing one. So this is our first 
art piece. Okay. So now, Sandy, we get to make our first art piece of creativity. Perfect. But the writing of it is going to be that when I put my hands here, the energy that I have placed of intention is what I'm going to be feeling. I can do that. Okay. So, um, and it's going to be hidden because we're going to um, create it our own way. I always like to think of it as like um, I'm right-handed, so I receive through my right hand, so I receive clarity, and I let go with my left, so what no longer is mine to let go of. My eyes, I feel like I'm having my hands out, and I'm just letting go of these things. Like, I'm just letting it go. And I then, see it. And then in the side of the hand, I'm just going to write what I want to hold on to. I love that. Yeah. So now we do our first masterpiece is that we just um, get creative okay. and put an intention to what is our grounding page. Okay. And so it. now the sky's the limit. You could literally design this to be whatever you want. Okay. If you guys are interested, we can come back. I can come back and we can start the journaling page so we can show you what that looks like. What do you guys think? And I could actually do like the full like how when I go to the class, how we would do a grounding exercise as well. As, yes. Yeah. I think that's really cool. We're going to just decorate our grounding page. And why don't you, if you could just tell them real quick, and some of them might not know, what is grounding and how is that effective to you? Okay. So, well, of course, I, on this. I go a little bit of a science piece of it, right? When we actually have an experience in our life that is... Um, some sort of threat, fear, loss, or this thought of rejection, how we talk about our amygdala, it goes into fight or flight, meaning that we're either going to be like, no, that's not right, or we're going to be like, nope, I'm out, which is great if we were under a serious threat of our lives being endangered, because that's what would keep us safe. But here's how we talked about earlier, the reality that we have made our minds and brains to believe that certain circumstances that are not life-threatening to react and respond as if they were. So then when we are in a fight or flight, we sky up into this fight or flight response of survival where our, our amygdala sends a sign down to our vagus nerve, our adrenaline kicks in, cortisol kicks in, and we're just like survival reacting. But we can't live there. And this is the thing, we want to be able to ground ourselves, not stay there long enough to work constantly anxious, feeling anxious, because that's what it feels like when you're in fight or flight, but more so be able to calm down to what is our healthy nervous system. And not to say that our healthy nervous system, like nothing happens there, like you're mm -hmm. sleeping and that's your healthy nervous system. When you're in your healthy nervous system, what's happening is that Things are occurring, but you're able to find resolution, meaning that you're able to feel the emotion, find an alternative resolution, and move forward. So a good example could be that I wake up late. Oh my goodness, panicky, right? Mm -hmm. But then I'm like, you know what? I'm just not gonna make breakfast. I'm just gonna order breakfast, be delivered. Fine, resolution. You get on the road, there's a car accident. Oh my God, I'm late. Wait, I take the side street. I don't need to be on the freeway. So there's another resolution. You get to, you know, so, I mean, I could go on and on and on, <laughs> right? But the practicing grounding to be in your healthy nervous system is that you're able to better manage and cope to be in your healthy nervous system and be able to respond rather than react. Because when you're in fight or flight, you're just like, I gotta go, I gotta go, I gotta go. And then you're not seeing your alternative solutions. You're just seeing black and white. Pass, fail, yes, no. So we have to get into this grounding of this healthy nervous system when we're able to either slow our breath, so physically our actual breath, our heart rate, to allow our brain to function, which is in our prefrontal cortex, which is what I call the CEO brain. Because when we're, when the amygdala reacts, this is what's happening is that it's sending a response that you're not even using like the best part of your brain. It is just responding for survival. So when you're in your healthy nervous system, if it is a meditation, breath work, stretching, you are getting into your healthy nervous system to allow the amygdala to know it's safe, 
and use your CEO brand. You've said this multiple times when you're like doing presentations is your body doesn't know when you're in pain, it doesn't know if you got hit by a car or if you're going through a breakup. Like, and that's actually with pain. Yes. So, the um, brain doesn't know the difference between emotional pain or physical pain. It just knows pain, which I think that is crazy because if you think about the, um, the toll that your body takes getting hit by a car, even if you don't physically get hit by a car and your car gets hit by a car that you're in, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, the way your body feels. And then to compare that to a breakup, which you would think, yes, a breakup is heartbreaking, but physical, like the physical pain of a car accident or something like that. Um, it's, it's kind of neat to think about in comparing the two and you're saying that your body doesn't know the difference no there's been um, many research studies where they actually connect the brain to all these wirings and they have um, shown pictures they and they've done different ways but the most famous one they show pictures of like past loved ones or somebody maybe that is no longer in their life and their brain alerted a signal uh, or an, a place in their brain where it was responding to the image and then they had a physical um, reaction of pain and exactly where the emotional pain was, it was the physical. Wow. So it doesn't know the difference. It responds from the same place. And then that's why, you know, when you are going through a breakup or a loss, it's so hard to get out of bed. Yes. Your I, body feels heavy, right? I, I know that when my, um, like I said, my best friend passed away and then four months my dad passed away, I, I had never felt that feeling of not just mentally being stuck, but like physically I felt stuck in like where, whether like you said in bed or just in that mindset. And so, um, it's crazy to have experienced that and to know that how true that is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, and I think, and maybe you can, you can, um, say how hard is it to get yourself out of there? Like what are things that you can do to get yourself out of bed or out of that, that mentally stuck place. Other than obviously seeing a therapist, which I highly recommend for yeah. everybody. But I think it's, um, one, we also talked about being compassionate towards yourself, mm. of that celebrating even the little things. So the little things is that, all right, at least I went to the restroom and I got out of the bed. Mm. So I know I could do that. Let me do it one more time and you know, what, what do I need to the next? Because every, everybody's going to be different. So whatever your accomplishment or your need in that moment is, and it might be as basic as eating, because sometimes you don't even want to get out of it to eat, right? Yeah. So it, it could be as basic as meeting your own basic needs. But it is looking at where you're at and what is your next step. Yeah. The one thing you shouldn't do, okay, because I can't tell you really what you should do because that's going to be different yeah. for everybody. And sometimes you just need to know what to not do. <laughs> yeah. So what you not need to do is, I'm an idiot, I'm worthless, my whole day is ruined. No, that's going to get you nowhere because the other psychology of it is that our thoughts create emotions, our emotions then create a reactive behavior. So if I wake up thinking like, oh my God, my life is worthless, like I did nothing, I'm probably going to feel worthless. I'm going to feel um, incompetent. I'm not going to feel good. Yeah. So if I don't feel good about myself, I'm definitely not going to want to get out of bed anymore. So now does that still apply whether you say it out loud or you just think it? I mean, it, it has its levels, right? And, it, and I think that if you're able to think it, you're also um, able to validate it to hear it. Kind of like our journal that I'm telling you that, you know, we have to hear it, see it, feel it. Mm -hmm. So it just um, revalidates whatever our senses that we need in that moment. The process of creating this brownie page that we're doing, mm -hmm. I'm assuming that it's still very therapeutic, just working on it. Yeah, so sometimes it's not even journaling. It could be coloring. You know how there's so many coloring books out? and just the creative aspect of selecting the colors that you selected. And you know, I have been feeling when I'm being creative, it feels such a sense of peace, mm -hmm. you know? Because you're allowing things to process out. I've grown to think that when you process things, you, you're talking about it and you're doing therapy, you know what I mean? Like those mm -hmm. things. So you're saying that even, you don't even have to do that. Like as simple as something, just drawing something or creating something that can be processing it. Yeah, if you're meeting the need of that emotion mm -hmm. and you're able to to process it physically 
through art. Yeah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you have to think emotions when they come, they just don't come like happy. Yeah. Then sad. No, it's like sad, frustrated, angry, but like it's a complex feeling of emotions huh. that you can't just even say one experience just has one emotion. Yeah. So sometimes even when you talk about it, you might talk about how you were sad, but you never talk about how you were also angry. Mm -hmm. And then to physically do it, as in you're like trying to process that experience, the anger might come out. Interesting. And so is, have you found at least like that a lot of people have that double or maybe I'm sure multiple feelings, but they only hone in on one. Yeah, and I think that's very common because for many people, we don't really analyze our emotions and, and we only... You mean nobody just sits there and just reflects and analyzes how they feel? <laughs> I mean, it's not the basics that <laughs> I learned in my household. So if ever, anybody else did, like, that is great. But I know for me, it's not. And for the people that I meet, it, it wasn't unfortunate Yeah, um, that we didn't. But I have to say that learning to express yourself, it, it comes in very different forms. I mean, there's some people that, you know... It comes through dancing, like mm -hmm. movement, and that, that's an additional piece to it. I guess we're like drawing right now, but imagine the people that are like fully moving their body, extending yeah. and moving emotion through their body and artistically through dance moves. Yeah. I mean, that's why like, you know, for some people dancing is like so therapeutic. Well, and I think, uh, and, and I'm sure there's a lot of people that feel this way, but I know like there's times where, one, I think watching people dance always makes me feel good like it always like, just like watching them dance I love it because they're having fun right yeah or just like the passion behind something like that is just I feel like you have to be so like in tuned with yourself mm -hmm. on like how to move and and to me I think dancing is so powerful because it I don't know I just feel like it makes you feel things that you know it can make you feel sad it can make you feel happy just depending on the movement of people and I think that is just so so powerful well, yeah, because those emotions through when we we're having these un, unprocessed emotions and then get stuck within our body, the that stuff is like a true thing. I mean, there's people that are overly anxious and have constipation, diarrhea, because our system literally is not moving because there's so much inflammation through the vagus nerve being overly activated. Mm -hmm. So you have to like move so through do you, that. Do you think that is have is is that Cause, like with anxiety of like the the stress and like your body not moving properly like where does that stem from well I guess it could be different for anybody it could it could be different for actually everybody but I mean there's like I think something in specific to like what we're talking to yeah. would be like irritable bowel syndrome mm -hmm. so you have like stomach pain well that stems from your amygdala overreacting sending signals to the vagus nerve the set the vagus nerve then connected to your gut which is your second brain is overly activated and it has over bacteria that then causes other physical and medical issues well and i think that's why uh, and we've talked about this before we're such high believers of your body tells shows you signs of how you're feeling or what you, what it needs your body feels tense. Your yeah, body's yeah. telling you something. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I know for me, after um, my family member was diagnosed with cancer, and it was this constant, like, fear, 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 that I started just, my stomach would just get bloated all of a sudden. Mm. And it was just my body responding to, like, fear. Yeah. And it was, like, this constant fear. And that's how my body started to respond. And so sometimes my stomach would be bloated and I'm like, I don't know what's going on. But then it was like, oh yeah, because I'm waiting for that call of the test result. Mm -hmm. But unconsciously knowing that it's coming, but my body was already knowing, like, I'm fearing what's going to come. Yeah. Well, and also we are also very big believers about how your gut is what they say, the big brain, uh, right, to, to your actual brain and how connected your systems are. It makes sense why you, you then have physical symptoms of depending on like, what you're going through. 100%. When everything happened with my friend and my dad, mm -hmm. 
I don't know if I felt physical symptoms or maybe I didn't reflecting on it. I don't, I can't think of any, mm -hmm. but I do know, I think that is definitely when I felt like my hair pulling out the most. I all of a sudden felt like, wow, my hair's looking really thin and the texture of it was so different and brittle. And, and I wonder if it was just that stress in my body telling me, do you need to figure out a way to cope with this? It could be the stress or it could be from the amygdala, like that constant fight or flight that you were meeting your basic needs. Mm. You probably weren't eating right, sleeping right, yeah, hydrating, because it, you were in this like tunnel of emotion. You were just looking for what can soothe that heaviness instead of like, what do I need? Yeah. We could be so stuck in our head of thinking of like the future, or as well as like I shoulda, coulda, woulda, which is the past. And I think that's like a really good measuring tool to also utilize. A good way to know the difference between stress and anxiety because they kind of like feel the same, right? Like yeah. it's pressure. That's the perfect word to say, <laughs> pressure, like the overwhelming pressure of, of it all, yes. Yeah, so stress is very much like, oh my God, I have all these things to do, but after Friday, I'm gonna be okay. So there's like mm. this end point to it to where anxiety, it's always this like zero to a hundred. Like, oh my God, if I don't do this until like, you know, on Friday when it's due, then I'm gonna lose my job. If I lose my job, I'm gonna be homeless. And then if I'm homeless, nobody's gonna be with me. If nobody's gonna be with me, I'm probably gonna die alone. And then I'm probably gonna rot. So then my cats are gonna eat me. And then mm -hmm. zero to a hundred. Yeah. yeah, I don't even know how long it takes <laughs> to get to that point. But it can definitely relate to, to being overwhelmed with what needs to get done or what the consequences are if they, it doesn't get done. So now if you think about if fight or flight is the first instinct in survival, which is feeling anxiety and we're not processing because we're just reacting to just survive and then comes the point where we're reflecting yeah. and then that and things that we should have done better could have done better and it feels heavy that's the shoulda coulda would have and it's in the past that's your free state which feels very much like depression hmm. which you have this heavy emotions carrying that you did not process because you were just reacting Interesting. Mm -hmm. So when you first started to do this, do you remember how it made you feel? I could remember the first day I did it. I literally got there at 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. I didn't leave until 4 p.m. Wow. Yeah, so I can't tell you what I remember feeling, mm -hmm. but I know it was fueling. Oh. A lot of emptiness in me. Wow. And... It was something that I was doing that literally from being such in the fight or flight, like anxiety of not being in control and my whole life is out of control. Yeah. To be able to just sit there and do something I felt in control and just calm and peaceful, no judgment. It was, I'm sure, a feeling of peace and release. And I know you're doing it now with me, but... Is this something that you can still continue to do this? Oh, 100%. So I have other journals and depending on the, the intention mm -hmm. of each journal, I'll take that journal out. And sometimes it just feels I have a lot of heavy emotion. I just need to let it out. Mm -hmm. I will also use this as like, let it out, Yeah. process, and then spend time with that emotion or feeling or thought. And then it, it just makes it, I guess for me personally, more simple to move forward and let it go. But then the more I'm able to process it and let it go, the more I'm teaching my brain to not hold on to that negative cognition. Mm. So I'm brain training. I've gone to therapy and obviously like I am surrounded by very smart, educated people. It feels good to know that everybody benefits from this. You can do things like this in the meantime to help yourself process things. Yeah. The thing too with therapy, as amazing as it is, if you're not open to it, then it's not it's not going to work. But that's with anything, right? Yeah. But if you're willing to see benefits in little things like this, then imagine when they are individualized for your needs. Oh, then it's yeah. like mind blowing. There's different approaches to therapy. Oh, yeah. Different therapists do different things. 100%. And everybody has their own specialty, um, even population that they focus on and, and they work with. And just depending on your needs. I will tell you this. I think from someone that has also, you know, I'll, I'll be honest. Yeah, I've also gone to therapy just to go to therapy, just to see what it feels like. <laughs> oh, I that's, that's very smart. 
And I would do that when I worked in a certain job where you had like five or six free sessions a year. Uh oh, and I'd be like, dang, I'm like, I'm gonna miss out on these sessions. I gotta go. And I would go even though I was okay, like I was perfectly fine because I worked in trauma too. I also wanted to see maybe there is something there that I'm not even recognizing, but because I'm constantly in these traumatic experiences, I wanted to make sure I didn't have secondary trauma, which is also a real thing. Even though I thought I was okay, I'd be like, oh, okay. But I also did it because I also thought it was very important to know what it felt like to be this client and what mm. were approaches that I liked and didn't like because not all therapists are the same. No, they are not. And no. there were some <laughs> therapists I'd be like, never doing that. Yes, I'm pretty sure I went to one therapist. I just didn't connect with her and I was like, okay, this person is just not for me. And it did take me a little bit of time to find somebody who guided me to where I needed to be to uh, process things. So I know that not every therapist is the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, and even culture, you know? Oh yeah. There's, I've had certain um, situations where there were therapists that didn't understand my culture. So certain things I wanted to say because I couldn't translate in English mm. that happened to me in a disagreement in Spanish, I'd, I would struggle to even express myself. Yes. There was like simple like things that you would get, like, you know, if I were to tell you, like, I put the las baterias, like, we already know what that means. Like, yeah, toughen up. But we would know it would be... But what she was saying is, like, put your battery, like, put in your batteries is in yeah. Spanish. Which is something moms tell you, like, if you're, like, slowly washing dishes, they'll be like... Put on your batteries. Come on. Get it up. Get, get it, it charged, charged up. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. And we know that all moms went to the same um, class for that, <laughs> that language. But, you know, somebody else wouldn't get it. They'd be like, what do you mean put on your batteries? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I know a good amount of people who, when they go to therapy, they actually want somebody who has the same background as them. And, it, or, you know, it could be like the same gender or the same, around the same age range. And ironically, my therapist now could not be more completely opposite than myself. And I feel he is a person who I've been really able to heal through through that experience. And so it's funny how everybody has a different not requirement, but I think it's based on the moments and needs. Oh, that's good. Yeah. You know, because there might be a time in your life that you don't need a specific ideal of like this nurturing place, but you need it like a connection being heard. Like you need to feel validated. You need yeah. to. Mm -hmm. And that's all something that, you know, just comes within connection. Yeah. It is mostly men. And maybe it's because it has such a negative outlook on men that who go to therapy and I feel like I hear more from them saying like well I can do this on my own what do you think is best like if they're interested in in going to therapy or just seeking help what is the best way do you think that they could approach it I think it's different for everyone um but I also feel like in life how are you gonna be able to love something or hate something if you don't try it hmm. yeah and if there's something within you thinking about it then that's already your sign so if you're thinking about it and you're even curious about it, I say better find out than to be in the shoulda, coulda, what of. Yeah. The worst case scenario, you just stop going. And right? yeah. like, <laughs> Hopefully you don't do it cold turkey and you just leave it because then, yeah, then that <laughs> obviously is a sign you should be going. Because <laughs> then that means you don't have healthy boundaries and mm. there are some issues with having closure. You know, a few people who whether they were iffy about going to marriage counseling or just going to therapy by themselves. And I think it really did have that negative view of like, oh my gosh, you're going to therapy? Like, oh my gosh, did you hear they're going to therapy? Like, it's so so negative about that. I think it's their own uncomfortableness mm -hmm. and I guess assumption mm -hmm. of, of, of what that means. But the reality yeah. is, is like, if you look at the most powerful and famous people, they've all gone to therapy. Why? Because it's self-growth self-awareness that are able to look at things from different perspectives yeah and that i think are the most creative minds and yeah. most um as to what you're saying i i do agree and because i know i've had a lot of people quite ask how do they go about it because they don't want to have people talk negative about it or make them feel a certain way about going to therapy yeah and i think you know you have every right to share as much as you feel you want to share yeah but this is the other thing, if, um, if you don't feel comfortable in sharing these things, um, it's a good exercise to understand why you feel uncomfortable. And are these people that you should 
not share these things and have in your life if you feel uncomfortable for bettering yourself. Yeah. Okay. So I think I'm just about done. I think so too, but mine's like coming like a little blur, but it's okay. I'm gonna <laughs> All right, guys, let me show you what I did and let me explain my concept. Um, so here it is. Here's my grounding page. So I did the blue inside because I feel like the blue represents like being calm and find my balance. And then I put uh, a pink and orange and yellow, almost like vibration, like vibrate, like vibrant colors on the outside of my hands. Cause I feel like when I'm grounding myself, I want to feel that power, not just like the balance within myself, but also the power of knowing that I can, I can really, I can let go of these negative feelings that I have and these negative thoughts. And then the green on the outside is the grass is always greener. So it's like once I let go of that, there's going to be good things that come to me. So, but it is for me. That's what I thought yeah. about. Because I thought to myself, okay, when I put my hands here, how do I want to feel? And I want to feel powerful within my own emotions, not just like actions, you know? Mm -hmm. I think you did it like amazing. Well, because I think too, when people think that like, oh, this person's really emotional or da, 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 it's looked down like so negative, you know, like it's negative to have these emotions, but I think it's very powerful to be vulnerable and to express yourself. Yeah. yeah. You know, I would say that that makes you very human. And if anything, what is really sad to me is not when somebody is overly emotional, it's when somebody is numb mm -hmm. and has no emotion. That to me is sad. Yeah. That to me is like, wow, like that they must be so alone. Yeah. When oh I my feel gosh. It. So when you're feeling emotional, I'm like, you're alive. Yes. yes. <laughs> I feel. really love this. Thank you. I know. And I just finished mine. I don't think mine is just like, what is this? Like my two purple hands. And I, I just want the same vibration. I love it. You know, a little bit more simple. This yeah. is very cool. See how other people perceive you to be so amazing, and then over here, you're like, "Here's a better." Everyone else like, is better. Yeah, we're all amazing. So now that we're done with our grounding, we're gonna let it dry, and then if you guys are interested in another video, we'll go ahead and come back and we'll start the journaling process. There's also other fun tricks that I'm gonna teach you that combine a specific way of journaling that assists. Um, the unconscious emotions to be processed. Ooh, you guys. That's, I mean, yeah. that's a game changer right there. We're putting a little bit of EMDR. <laughs> Ooh, and yes, I will talk about it next time. If you guys are interested, so comment down below. If you guys have ever done a Smashbook journal, um, and if you guys are interested in doing this, or if you guys are interested in another video with Liliana, we can go over the journaling aspect of it. I just had so much fun. I know, me too. Like, like <laughs> always. <laughs> Thank you for the time and the space too. Everybody. Yes. All right, guys. So I'll make sure to put Liliana's Instagram on the description down below. Is there anywhere else people can reach you uh, other than Instagram? Yeah. So I have uh, my TikTok, which is also the same as my Instagram, which is um, yamas underscore therapy. Or even my website, which is www.yamastherapy.com. Yamas, double L. So it is L-L-A-M-A-S therapy.com. And I'll make sure to also leave that um, all of her links down below too if you guys want to contact her. So um, until next time, you guys, let us know what you guys thought of this video. I had so much fun and we'll see you guys next time. Yes. Bye.